amount of man with no time to lose Cause he don't believe in time, he know what it's time to do Get the breaking shackles, taking gambles, make a man who take his ladder Hate his rampant, fake his fashion, fade his happen Make a caption, change the channel, take a stand and fade the castle Make it fast, make it last, so baby you won't make it past the first stage Your story ended on the first page What a fine group of animals the earth made We've been locked since they put us in the first cage So we last out in a fit of hurt rage but I've been around since the first age So I walk around the stage like a fucking maze And you can reach for it only if you're timeless Or you can keep yours but only if you're spineless Shit hit the world like I wrote Dutch Cause it's split down the middle when there's no guts Fuck a half full, half empty, fill the whole cup I should be able to drink till I throw up And a bunch of scary ass rappers with no nuts All afraid to be honest cause they wanna blow up But a man who's not built by the circle of time Knows there's nothing worse than guilt If shit comes back around, where did it really go? Think about it, drink about it, let it go If shit comes back around, where did it really go? Think about it, drink about it, let it go Be a more This episode will be a review and update on the different characteristics in the ancestral genealogies of man. The resources used in this video will be various sources from a range of academic disciplines, including but not limited to history, genetics, anthropology, geography, natural history, and mythology. We investigate the religious writings from the ancient past, in particular canonized texts, rabbinical writings, apocryphal scripture, and Torah. The purpose of this project is not to denigrate or label any group of people as evil or less than anyone else. This study is in the genealogy of modern man and its relationship to ancient biblical bloodlines. Race and color are not the same. As we have learned throughout this series, our general ideas about race are generally wrong. And most of our ideas about race and the history of race 
have been social constructs built off the back of colonialism. In terms of race, colonialism represented a world-changing transition of genetics. Several groups from one side of the world brought their genetics across the ocean to the other side of the world, and the face of world ancestry changed. As mentioned previously, the first Europeans who colonized and settled in the Americas were predominantly groups of Sephardic Jews and Moors out of Europe and North Africa, and they could hardly be considered white. The black and white concept of race as we know it today didn't exist at the time, and rather than black or even African, by the late 17 and 1800s, these Europeans were often labeled as free people of color. And many of these people were an amalgamation of North African and European ancestry. In addition to being Sephardic Jews, the first colonial groups also shared genetic parentage with Moors and Huguenots, all of which were exiled from previously Moorish controlled territories after the fall of Granada in 1491. This meant that afterwards these people sought refuge and relocation as a result of a loss of war and subsequently loss of territory. For those who didn't leave, they were forced to convert to Catholicism through the Inquisition. This was the event that facilitated mass immigration to America, as well as other hidden events. Some of these exiles still continued practicing Judaism and Islam in secrecy, labeled Moriscos and Conversos. Even more so than the classical Catholic or Protestant Christian, the common religious identity of the first settlers were Muslims and Sephardic Jews, and their genetics were a combination of Hamitic and Japhetic DNA. Hamitic due to North African Mediterranean bloodlines and Japhetic due to their Caucasus ancestry. These characteristics are well documented and accepted by geneticists and anthropologists as an ethnogenetic classification for the Mediterranean populations of Southern Europe and Northern Africa. However, there is a question about the general ancestry of some of these people that not only blurs the line between race and religion, but also race and history. That question is, who is a Shemite? Or from what lands would a Shemite originate? Both Sephardic Jews and African Moors claim and are accepted to be of some Shemitic ancestry. Yet, that ancestry comes from the fact that the accepted locations of a portion of their parentage is attributed to the accepted borders of modern-day Israel actually being the ancient location of the Israelites. Thus, the Shemitic label is founded in location of supposed ancestry rather than genetic variation or difference. For example, Hamites have a higher percentage of so-called sub-Saharan Negro ancestry than do most Caucasians in general, as the further you get from the Mediterranean, the less Negro ancestry is in the bloodlines of the people. Going all the way into East Asia, South Asia, Australia, and the Pacific Islands, where there is virtually no sub-Saharan so-called Negro ancestry. Both Japhetic and Hamitic bloodlines carry varying degrees of Neanderthal DNA. And conversely, as you travel east into Asia, those levels of Neanderthal DNA increase. Contrary to what most people may think, East Asians, Australians, and Pacific Islanders have higher amounts of Neanderthal ancestry than the classical Western or Eastern European. This also means that Europeans are more closely related to sub-Saharan Negroes than are any of these groups in Asia and the Pacific Islands. The label of Shemite for the most part applies to people who claim ancestry from the area around the Levant, Arabian Peninsula, Iraq, and Iran. Their alleged Shemitic ancestry again is founded in supposed biblical location rather than genetics and asserts that their ancestors were the ancient Israelites during the days of the Old Testament, and possibly they were the northern tribes deported into Assyria. But we all know this assertion is not so black and white. For one, all Shemites aren't Israelites. There are several generations between Shem, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Furthermore, Edomites, 
should be regarded as genetically based in pre-Israelite parentage, sharing the same identifiable root genetics through Isaac, the father of Esau and Jacob, whose descendants would later be called Israelites and Edomites. Yet, from this point, there is a distinct genetic split between fraternal bloodlines. Jacob specifically inbred, marrying and having children with his cousins Leah and Rachel, the daughters of his uncle Laban, his mother's brother. He also had children with their handmaidens Zilpah and Bilhah, who may or may not have been related to Laban, as varying sources pitch multiple theories on their parentage. The apocryphal work of the Testament of Naphtali says that Zilpah and Bilhah were the daughters of Rotheus, a man taken into captivity, but redeemed by Laban. According to the story, Laban gave Rotheus a wife named Una, who was the girl's mother. These relationships were prior to Exodus, thus before the restrictions established in the book of Leviticus concerning sexual relations with next of kin. Be all this as it may, the book of Leviticus doesn't necessarily endorse nor prohibit one from marrying one's cousin, within our current understanding of the text. All this is to demonstrate that the sons of Jacob, i.e. the first tribes of Israel, at least half, seven out of 12, were the result of inbreeding. Conversely, the line of Esau specifically outbred, marrying Canaanite foreign women with varying degrees of non-human DNA, from possible troglodytes to Rephaim. Genesis 26 says Esau, at 42 years old, took to wife, Judith, daughter of Beri the Hittite, and Basimoth, the daughter of Elon the Hittite. However, in Genesis 36, among the list of descendants of Esau, it reads that he took to wife Adah, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, and Elohibama, the daughter of Zibion the Hivite, and Basimoth, Ishmael's daughter. Names not matching the previous wives and fathers. Basimoth is listed in chapter 26 as the daughter of Elon the Hittite, but in chapter 36, Basimoth is listed as the daughter of Ishmael. Also in chapter 36, there is no mention of Judith, the daughter of Beri the Hittite. Instead, in chapter 36, the name given as the daughter taken from Elon the Hittite is named Adah and not Judith. Nonetheless, this demonstrates the fact that Esau bred outside of the family particularly among Canaanite women, who were essentially frowned upon and regarded as abominable idol worshippers who served other gods. This was the main reason for Jacob leaving and going to the house of Bethuel to sojourn with his mother's brother Laban and take one of his daughters to marry. From this point, there is a genetic line drawn between who is a Shemite and who is an Edomite, all patrilineal generations between Shemites are included from the time of Shem to the time of Jacob. But after the lines of Jacob and Esau, two different factions came forth, the Edomites and the Israelites. All generations in prior lineages can only be considered Shemites and not Edomites or Israelites. Taking a deeper look at the generations of Shem, we go back to Genesis 10 and 11 and the times before and after the Tower of Babel. The generations and sons of Shem are broken up into both chapters, leading the reader to ask questions regarding not just the identity of Shem, but also Eber, the person for whom the Hebrew ethnonym is named. Genesis 10 21 states, unto Shem also the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the elder, even unto him children were born. Verse 22 lists the five sons of Shem, presumably in chronological birth order, Elam, Ashur, Arphaxad, Lud, and Aram. Verse 23 lists the sons of Aram, and verse 24 lists one son, Salah, and the son of Salah, Eber. Verse 25 states that unto Eber were born two sons, the name of one was Peleg, 
for in his day was the earth divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. This verse simply implies, if not outright states, Eber had two sons. The following verses in chapter 10 only list the sons of Joktan. However, in chapter 11, it states that Shem was 100 years old and begot Arphaxad two years after the flood. And Shem lived after he begot Arphaxad 500 years and begot sons and daughters. And the other four sons of Shem, Elam, Ashur, Lud, and Aram, are not mentioned in chapter 11. In previous cases, for example, prior orders of mention were as follows, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, in what we perceive as chronological order of birth. But in chapter 9, verse 24, the text refers to Ham as the youngest. And of course, the somewhat confusing phrase in chapter 10 that states, Shem is the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the elder, which could imply in actuality that Japheth could possibly be the elder or the younger. If the birth orders in chapter 10 are listed correctly, then Elam and Ashur were born before Arphaxad, which would seemingly contradict chapter 11, verse 10, which states that Shem begot Arphaxad two years after the flood. But in the previous chapter, at least two sons were born before Arphaxad, the third son, indicating there is a minimum of 27 months required to have a third child, two years after the flood. Or possibly one child, Elam, could have been conceived and maybe even born before the end of the flood. But that doesn't seem to be documented anywhere that we can find. Or is the Shem mentioned in chapter 10 different from the Shem in chapter 11? Previously, when this kind of parallelism is displayed in chapters 4 and 5, it was listing the generations of Cain and Adam. Many of the names mentioned in the line of Cain mirrored the names mentioned in the line of Adam in the following chapter, including the name Lamech, the father of Noah. Moreover, concerning the son of Arphaxad, Eber, chapter 10, verse 25 states Eber had two sons. One was Peleg and his brother was Joktan. But the verse 17 in chapter 11 states, And Eber lived after he begot Peleg 430 years and begot sons and daughters. This verse implies that Eber had at least three sons, which means that this verse explaining the children of Eber doesn't match the previous chapter. An ambiguous caveat to the mention in the previous chapter is Joktan being the brother of Peleg, rather than saying Eber begot Joktan, which the verse doesn't say. It instead says Peleg's brother is Joktan. This could be a secret insinuation that Joktan is Peleg's brother, but possibly not an actual son of Shem. So once again, defining a Shemite is not so black and white. When we look at the corresponding references in the Aramaic Targum and the Book of Jasher, we find the information mostly consistent with a few nuggets added for detail. For example, the Book of Jasher names more sons of Elam, Ashur, Arphaxad, Lud, and Aram than does the King James Version. One of the most important nuggets given in both Jasher and the Aramaic Targum are the names and locations given for the families of the lines of Ham and Japheth. These are significant details missing from the King James Version or any other version published at a later date. The Targum is consistent with the King James Version in chapters 10 and 11 in regard to the children of Shem and Eber. However, the allusion to Joktan actually being the son of Shem is more solid, referring to him as the other son opposed to Peleg's brother. Another nugget from Jasher, reflecting the days of Peleg when the sons of men were divided. Two stages in Peleg's life. In his days, the sons of men were divided, and in the latter days, the earth was divided. Jasher, referring to Joktan in the corresponding verse, Joktan meaning that in his day the lives of the sons of men were diminished and lessened. A point not mentioned in either the King James or the Targum, but the Targum does mention that the sons of Joktan, Almoded, and Shaleph measured the earth with lines and led forth the waters of rivers. Conversely, 
Only Jasher lists the generations of Jacques Tan and Peleg alongside each other prior to the ascension of Nimrod and the narrative of the tower. As a result of cross-referencing these texts, the generations who were scattered after the tower are more clearly defined. While defining a Shemite might be quite the task, defining a Gentile is far less challenging. The first mention of Gentiles in Genesis is in direct association with the sons of Japheth. In general, most Gentiles are simply defined as non-Israelites, but the specifics of this term are a bit more tedious. According to certain rabbinical writings, Gentiles are often defined as non-human. They are also referred to as goy or goyim. In most contexts, they are defined as a nation, ethnos, i.e. a collective body of non-Israelites. So technically, according to the rabbinical teachings, even Shemites who aren't Israelites are considered Gentiles or goyim. In biblical literary terms, Gentiles are represented as the people who worship other or strange gods, in some cases a synonym for heathen, a word used just as much if not more throughout scripture than Gentile, but is almost exclusively in reference to Gentiles. So in this context, a blood-related Israelite who worships other gods could also be defined as a Gentile. But in its initial usage in Genesis, the word Gentiles is used in the phrase Isles of the Gentiles in direct correlation with the ancestry of Japheth. In its second mention, Gentiles was used to describe Harosheth Hagoyim or Harosheth of the Gentiles. But in this case, in the saga of Sisera and Jael, Sisera is under the command of Jabin, king of Canaan, making the first two associations of tribes in reference to Gentiles, Canaanites and Japhethites. But is there any truth to the idea of Gentiles being non-human? To give this an honest assessment, we must meet at the intersection of mythology, scripture, and science. What does it mean to be non-human? And does that mean a Gentile is some type of animal or beast in the field? Possessing the body of a human, but the spirit of an animal? Could it simply be the fact that a person may be atheist or worship strange gods or even sacrifice their children that makes them a non-human or animal? Or is there a genetic basis for this notion? Is there a genetic predisposition for evil? And would this notion have anything to do with the varying amounts of Neanderthal or animal or angelic or any other types of DNA found in populations around the world? What about the giants? Would they be considered human, animal, or something else? What about the Yamin, the asses Ana found in the wilderness opposite to the lands of the people, who had the upper torso of animals and the lower extremities of men? What would they be considered? So we're going to look at a few rabbinical writings that speak to the idea that Gentiles are non-human. And most of these rabbinical writings are written by you know whom, who live in you know where, who swear that the place that they currently live, that they just immigrated to less than 100 years ago, is the actual location of the Old Testament. Nonetheless, we're quoting from Israel Shashak. Jewish history, Jewish religion. In explicit thoughts from the Talmud and other rabbinical writings. So when we investigate these rabbinical writings, we're doing so to express the ultimate scholarship in our approach. It is important to investigate their writings for true insight into the mentality of certain bloodlines. 
Quote, it must be admitted at the outset that the Talmud and the Talmudic literature, quite apart from the general anti-Gentile streak that runs through them, which will be discussed in greater detail in chapter 5, contain very offensive statements and precepts, especially against Christianity. For example, in addition to a series of scurrilous sexual allegations against Jesus, the Talmud states that his punishment in hell is to be immersed in boiling excrement. A statement not exactly calculated to endear the Talmud to devout Christians. Going to stop right there. So the Talmud teaches that Jesus is boiling in shit in hell. His punishment in hell is to be immersed in boiling excrement, according to the rabbinical writings. This is where the rabbis get to go crazy and reinterpret certain ideas within scripture that may be somewhat difficult to interpret. So these writings are created as a series of teachings that are supposedly in relation to the Torah. Continuing. It should also be stated that the ancient language of these people who call themselves Jews who live in modern day Palestine is Yiddish, a Germanic language, and is not in any way based in Hebrew. Modern Hebrew English Dictionary published in Israel correctly defines Shekets as follows, unclean animal, loathsome creature, abomination, wretch, unruly youngster, Gentile youngster, end quote. So we can look at rabbinical writings and we can see that there is an ingrained racism against Gentiles, quote from Jews and Jewish history, quote, According to what Avner wrote in his book, any Jew is capable of judging whether a non-Jewish child should in this sense be considered and punished as an adult. Rabbi Avner explained that all prior response had dealt only with the actual commissions of crimes by non-Jewish children. He explained in his answer that if a non-Jewish child intended to commit murder, for example, by throwing a stone at a passing car, that the non-Jewish child should be considered a persecutor of the Jews and should be killed. Citing Maimonides as his authority, Avner maintained that killing the non-Jewish child in this instance is necessary to save a Jewish life. Quote, Shashak, Jewish history, Jewish religion. Quote, the text of the Halakha, Mishnah and Talmud some of which have been obscured from the public eye for political reasons, reveal an inhuman, utterly unacceptable perception of the non-Jew, the Gentile. Equally disturbing for Shashak was the inability of modern-day Israel to learn from what he saw as the egotistic and ethnocentric Jewish behavior throughout history, in particular in the 19th century, which was a period and location chosen by Shashak, not by random choice, but due to the formative role they still play in the Zionist narrative as justifying the drive to colonize Palestine. End quote. I want to stop here. The rabbinical literature is extremely racist, especially towards Gentiles, who the so-called Jews over there in so-called Israel are claiming is not them. This is another important point that should be made, that the people who live in Palestine today are not even indigenous to that area. They are invaders based upon the perpetuation of a false identity. The so-called Jews who currently live in Palestine, who have pushed out the Palestinians, they are actually from Russia. These are Russian Jews who under the bankroll of the Rothschilds was able to fund territory that eventually gave them a sovereign state of Israel. And that didn't happen until 1948. So the idea that this Israel is thousands of years old is a fallacy.
Throughout the history and pages of scripture, there are plenty of nations of non-humans that played some type of role, whether that's in the creation of Genesis 1, when God says, let us make man in our image, implying plurality, when man and woman were created through speech at the same time, or the creation of Genesis 2, where Lord God, a different entity, creates Adam or man from the dust of the ground, takes his rib during a slumber and creates Eve essentially the next day, meaning that the order from Genesis 1 doesn't match the order from Genesis 2, indicating two different creations and at least two different creators. By chapter 4, the Lord God of Genesis 2 and 3 is gone or retitled, and the title being used is simply Lord, denoting a different consciousness rather than the plurality of God in Genesis 1 or the Lord God of Genesis 2 and 3. Within the first five chapters of Genesis, we have already been introduced to God's lords, beasts, and men. And this is all before chapter 6 when we meet giants for the first time, or so we assume. Genesis 6 states that there were giants in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became the mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. A few things to unpack from this verse alone. There were giants in those days and also after that. Yes, there were giants before the flood, but also after the flood. Shouldn't the flood have killed everyone on earth except for Noah and his family? How did the giants survive the flood? Was someone on the ark a giant? The chapter says the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took wives and they came into them and bare children. The same became the mighty men, which were of old men of renown. A nugget in between these lines, of course, verse three. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive for man for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years for that. He also is flesh. This is a sharp yet subtle indication that the Lord himself could also be flesh. This very human possibility of the entity titled the Lord being flesh echoes louder in chapter 8, where the Lord expresses a very human characteristic in smelling the sweet savor of Noah's burnt offering. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not curse the ground any more for man's sake a phrase more indicative of the line of Cain rather than Noah. Notwithstanding, there are several examples within the early chapters of Genesis to identify a spectrum of spirits from gods to men to beasts and everything in between, most likely where the majority of spirits exist on the spectrum. The spectrum of spirits runs from the plurality of God in Genesis 1 to the Lord God of Genesis 2 to the Lord of Genesis 4 to the sons of God in Genesis 6 to their offspring in Genesis 6 to the giants of Genesis 6 and any generation of giant angelic hybrid. And this doesn't include the other end of the spectrum between man and beast or the hybrid man beast opposite to the lands of the people in Genesis 36. Genesis 6, 9 makes a point to say that Noah was a just man, a double entente, and perfect in his generations, meaning his genetics had yet to be corrupted. However, in mentioning his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, there is no quotation in reference to the perfection of their generations, which means Noah's wife, whether that be Namah, or Emzara was perfect in her generations, meaning that they had some mutation of either angelic or beast DNA. Unto this day, there have been countless examples of people who have characteristics akin to mysterious angelic or beast DNA on official record. For example, 2 Samuel 21.20, in reference to Goliath, there was yet a battle in Gath, where was a man of great stature, that had on every hand six fingers, and on every foot six toes, four and twenty in number. 
he was also born to the giant, meaning the father of the six-fingered Goliath was included in the ancestry of the descended spirits. According to several sources, polydactyly having six digits, fingers or toes, is most likely a genetic mutation that occurs in as many as one in 500 people. Some sources even say that higher rates occur among African Americans. Be all this as it may, biblically speaking, six digits is indicative of the bloodline of descended spirits. That is just one genetic anomaly we can account for. Other genetic anomalies include small races of people, some refer to as pygmy. There are even people with horns and tails. On record, goat, sheep, pig, and dog hybrids exist in real life. This isn't legend, this is a little known apocryphal truth. These species of hidden hybrids who resemble the Yumi are probably walking the earth at this very moment. All right, we are back with another banger from Charlatan's Web. This will be fun. Xenotransplantation. Xenos. From the Greek meaning foreign or strange. Or heterologous transplant. I think that's how you say that. Is the transplantation of living cells, tissues, or organs from one species to another. This quote is hybrid and chimeras. A consultation on the ethical and social implications of creating human animal embryos in research 2007 Arizona State think about that the ethical implications of creating human animal embryos this is in 2007 xenotransplantation is an artificial method of creating an animal human chimera that is a human with a subset of animal cells so that's the artificial way of doing it. Step one, growing a human ear on a pig's back. Step two, growing a human nutsack on a pig's ear. To what end, I ask you? To what end? In contrast to an individual where each cell contains genetic material, quotation, from a human, and an animal is called a human-animal hybrid. They speak about these things so matter-of-factly so you know it's going on. Quote, defined by the magazine H Plus as genetic alterations that are blendings of animal and human forms such as hybrids may be referred to by other names, occasionally as parahumans. Para-humans. They may additionally be called humanized animals. So the hybrids have their own pronouns. I'm not a hybrid. I'm a para-human, okay? No, I'm a humanized animal. No, I'm an animalized human. No, I am a hairy human with animal features. Sorry, continuing. Technically speaking, they are also related to cybrids, cytoplasmic hybrids, with cybrid cells featuring foreign human nuclei inside of them being a topic of interest. Possibly a real world human animal hybrid may be an entity formed from either a human egg fertilized by a non human sperm or a non human egg fertilized by a human sperm. Pretty basic there. See what's going on? Sperm and eggs from humans and animals. They're not talking about this like this is something that's impossible. Here's the hook, right? Throughout the past, human evolution, there has been interbreeding between archaic and modern humans. Stop there. 
archaic and modern humans, right? Even the terminology of archaic human is indicative of some sort of alternative DNA and modern humans. The true definition of both is alternative DNA. They have to use modern human as a person with that alternative DNA to amalgamate the definition to include everybody in the world. So you have a modern human who has Neanderthal DNA. For example, Neanderthal genes accounts for 1-4% to of modern human genomes for people outside of sub-Saharan Africa. And here is another hook. You gotta be careful because they'll fool you with the fuckery. They're using outside of sub-Saharan Africa to try to include the rest of the continent south of the Sahara, which is just not true. The Adam Y DNA is specifically in West Africa, not anywhere else on the continent. And there is a specific reason why, because whenever that DNA, the Adam Y DNA arrived on the continent, at some point, that Adam Y DNA interbred with something that wasn't human and created the entire races of people of Africa. The majority of all Africans on the continent have some sort of Neanderthal DNA, which comes from interbreeding between species. Of course, the whole jig of evolution is up. There is no evolution. It's hybridization. So whenever that Y DNA went to Africa, he interbred with something that wasn't human and created the races of Africa. Sexual selection and geographic proximity are the most significant factors in determining the physical appearance of the races. Why are these the only people without Neanderthal DNA? Because if you go south, and this is the part of the hook that they don't really explain. If you go south of West Africa, if you go to other places south of the Sahara, there's Neanderthal DNA everywhere. What do you find? You find all of these half human, half apes. You find Australopithecine, you find Homo erectus, Homo habilis, you find all of these in between species all over Africa. They existed. For example, Neanderthal genes accounts for 1 to 4% of modern human genomes for people outside of sub Saharan Africa. That's because those people just got to Africa. They haven't been over there long enough. That's because they just got over there. That was never their land. They didn't live in the Isles of the Gentiles. They didn't live among the Yamim. They didn't live opposite to the lands of the people. However, as archaic humans may not be classified as animals, such interbreeding is generally not classified as human-animal hybridization. Whoa. However, archaic humans may not be classified as animals, such interbreeding is generally not classified as human-animal hybridization. There's the caveat. Hey guys, we, we've defined it already, okay? So, no animals here. You know, they're, they're, they weren't animals, they were archaic humans, all right? All right, all right. Following the days of the tower when the sons of men were scattered abroad, set the template for the map of world genetics as we see it today. From Babel, men were dispersed, some going into their habitations of inheritance that had been prescribed by Noah following the flood. But some didn't go into their inherited lands and instead invaded the territories of their brethren. This in particular was the case with the sons of Ham and Canaan. Jasher chapter 10 describes how four men of Ham, Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboim, went to the land of the plain. And Seir, son of Hur, son of Hivai, went to a valley opposite to Mount Paran and built the city of Seir. 
and it is called the land of Seir unto this day. The chapter explains that particularly the sons of Ham and Canaan built places as they found fit, opposed to the places of their inheritance. Presumably they built cities all over, as several references are made to them being spread abroad before the tower and scattered afterwards. The Canaanites were a large and powerful nation full of mixed and or hybrid type peoples that were an amalgamation between bloodlines. Canaan, who was listed as a son of Ham, saw the nakedness of his father Noah and is thus cursed by Noah to be a servant to both Shem and Japheth. There are several theories concerning the curse of Ham, which is actually the curse of Canaan. The most easily identifiable is the theory that Ham, by seeing his father's nakedness, actually slept with his mother or Noah's wife, therefore causing Noah to curse Canaan instead of Ham because Canaan would be the offspring of an incestuous mother-son sexual encounter. This is in correspondence with Leviticus 18.8. The nakedness of thy father's wife shalt thou not uncover. It is thy father's nakedness. This is a reference to thy father's nakedness having a deeper connotation. Taking a general consensus on everything we've learned thus far and putting it into a box of understandable context, we should start with the genetics of the sons of Noah and establish certain characteristics unique to each of their bloodlines. With this information, we can get a far more insightful picture of past history than we have ever seen before. And that history begins after the destruction of the tower. The reason this period of time is so important is because the people of earth were all unified by language and the language that the people spoke was far more powerful than any language ever spoken since. These people were unanimously coordinated through the speech of creation, the holy language in which life was divinely spoken into existence. And with that language, they aimed to destroy their creator. A historical demonstration of how the haughtiness of man and his evil imagination has no bounds and at his lowest point would destroy the earth with his reckless pride. And yet the solution for that pride causing the downfall of men wasn't really all that complicated in the grand scheme of the world or creation. All they had to do was confound the languages and the men fell themselves simply through lack of communication. From the tower, people were scattered into different languages, nations, and divisions. The families of Japheth, who were scattered afterwards, went into their lands according to their generations, built cities, and called them after their names and occurrences. Jasher makes a point to say, into many divisions and languages, alluding to the idea that the families of Japheth carry more divisions and languages than do the bloodlines of the other brothers. The lands of Japheth are also the easiest to locate based upon the available information in our resources. Most of the places and names listed in Jasher match the names of present day locations accurately. The Isles of the Gentiles are associated initially with the sons of Japheth. They were labeled the Isles of the Gentiles before the scatter of the tower. This points directly to the lands of Japheth being the Eurasian continent, especially the regions above the Mediterranean. Most of the other areas south of the Mediterranean and the Himalayas should also be considered Gentile, but in more close association with the sons of Ham. 
The sons of Japheth play a more significant role in the days after the establishment of the nation of Israel than the times before, when the history is more centered around Canaan, Babylon, Egypt, and Assyria. The sons of Japheth especially emerge during the fall of Israel, being mentioned in the prophecies of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, and Daniel as those coming from the land of the far north to wreak havoc. Ezekiel 38, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophecy against him. The chapter relays the narrative concerning the armies of Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and many sons of Japheth, and their attack on Israel. The associated prophecies relate that the sons of Japheth, the sons of Javan, Elisha, Tarshish, Katim, and Dodanim were traders of slaves and bronze, but also traders and merchants of the sea. The biblical references to these nations of Gentiles parallels hand in hand who and what we know these people to have a history of today, particularly during colonialism. The Japhethite stock comes from these ancestral characteristics. Labeled Gentiles before their generations, some might take this to mean that these people are non-believers from birth or essentially atheists. Hence the mention of the root of Jesse being an ensign of the peoples and to it shall the Gentiles seek. This may foreshadow an inherited complex that prevents Gentiles from spiritually grasping the conscious divinity and grace of creation, thus causing them to live an existence void of greater purpose chasing wicked and fruitless desires, a people endowed with earthly intellect, but with the nature of beasts. And that beast flows through the blood of their ancestors. Simple characteristics of a Japhethite include light skin and to a lesser extent, light eyes. Conversely, dark skinned and dark eyed Japhethites do exist. The lands of Japheth, however, are some of the coldest and most frigid in the world. Although some of the earliest ancestors in Europe and Asia at one time had dark skin and light eyes, today the majority of the people who inhabit these areas have the whitest skin on Earth. According to the Skin Pigment Index, Northeast Asians and Siberians are the lightest skinned races on Earth, although albino groups exist. This portion of Japheth is by far one of the largest population groups in the world including most of Europe, Central Asia, Mongolia, Siberia, Korea, and China. There are many races, nations, and languages in this territory. Some would presume the most languages and borders of any other continent on Earth. This also points to the fact that Japheth is mixed with everything and everybody, including the lines of Ham, closer to Europe, and Canaan closer to the Middle East. Comparatively, Ham is said to be the progenitor of the dark-skinned races, but these races are also on the spectrum of Caucasian or Japhethite ancestry. The sons of Ham were the founders of the earliest civilizations following the Tower of Babel, which was built by Nimrod, son of Cush, son of Ham. The early Hamites intermingled with many Shemites. Genesis mentions Ashur. Genesis 10 states that Ashur went out of that land, Babel, and built Nineveh, Rehoboth, and Kalah. This verse shows at some point that the Ashurites, the lineage of Shem, were at one time in some way proximate with Nimrod and the sons of Ham. Conversely, prior to the saga of the tower, when Nimrod was 40 years old, According to Jasher, there was a war between Nimrod and his brethren, the children of Japheth, and he put them under his power and subdued them. And they all came to dwell in Shinar, theoretically to help with the construction of the tower, which could be the reason why Japheth was scattered into so many divisions. As we understand it, Noah cursed Canaan for the transgressions of Ham, uncovering his father's nakedness. But Ham had three other sons, Cush, Foot, and Mitzrayim. 
Mitzrayim fathered several nations, the Ludim, the Anamim, the Luhabim, the Naphtarim, the Pathrusim, the Kashluhim, out of who came the Philistines and the Kaphtarim. This portion of Genesis demonstrates that Ham's lineage intermingled with giants, for he is the ancestor of Goliath. The proposed land of the Hamites is the northern portion of Africa, around the Horn. As well, it has been theorized that the Cushitic Empire held influence as far as India, and there is plenty of genetic evidence pointing to a relationship between these two civilizations in the ancient past. In the Aramaic Targum, a province in the countries of Ham is named Hindiki, indicating its connection to India and the Hindu people. Prior to colonialism, India wasn't known as India, but instead was known as Hindustan, matching the same title given. Known for idol worship and elephants, this characteristic denotes a relationship to one of the divisions who were scattered following the destruction of the tower. Jasher 935 states that the idol worshippers who wanted to worship and put an idol at the top of the tower were turned into apes and elephants. As we know, there are plenty of people with ape DNA from the interbreeding with groups of Homo erectus and Australopithecine. But is there any truth to the wild possibility of people actually having elephant DNA? And Ham begot Canaan. If there were a biblical bloodline that would be considered pure evil or genetically predisposed to evil more so than anyone else, that would be a Canaanite. Canaan begot Sidon and Heth, his firstborn sons, and the Jebusite and the Amorite, the Girgashite, the Hivite, the Archite, the Sinite, the Ardavite, the Zimarite, and the Hamathite. From Canaan sprang several generations of non-human beings with a variation of giant and hybrid animal DNA. Jubilees chapter 10 relates that Canaan saw the land of Lebanon to the river of Egypt, that it was very good, and went not into the land of his inheritance. And he dwelt in the land of Lebanon, eastward and westward, from the border of Jordan, from the border of the sea. Later in the chapter, Ham, the father of Canaan, explicitly tells him not to dwell in the lands of Shem, that if he does, his sons will fall by a sedition and will be cursed beyond all the sons of Noah. But he did not hearken to the words of his father. Several Canaanite nations were exterminated during the wars of Joshua following the Exodus. The Shemite is mixed with several nations of animal hybrids and giants as well. Even from the earliest days, the sons of Shem, Ashur, and Elam had set up their own kingdoms following Babel. And of course, Assyria became one of the greatest enemies of the Israelites, deporting their northern tribes far beyond the river. Abraham was the son of Terah a well-known idol worshiper and prince of the host of Nimrod. Be all this as it may, it was Abraham who received the blessing for the promised land and the continuation of his seed. This demonstrates on some level that the sins of the father didn't necessarily translate from father to son. By the time of the Israelites and the Edomites, the Shemitic bloodlines had been widely dispersed throughout the nations and the world and weren't just limited to the progeny of Abraham. Edom, for example, comprised of all types of non-human genetics after marrying and having children with Canaanite women. Eliphaz, the son of Esau, had a child with Timnah, a Horite, and sister of Lotan, and from them came forth Duke Amalek, progenitor of the Amalekites. Many people have associated the Amalekites with giants, but there isn't much evidence 
to suggest that they were anything more than evil and the enemies of Israel. But the Horites from whom the concubine Timna comes from are said to be troglodytes or cave dwellers. According to Numbers 24.20, Amalek was the first of the nations. This implies that the Amalekites were the first Gentiles as the phrase the nations has been used interchangeably, meaning that the earliest nations of Gentiles were in reality Edomites mixed with troglodytes. According to the Midrash, the Amalekites were sorcerers who would transform themselves to resemble animals in order to avoid capture. Thus, in 1 Samuel 15, 3, it is considered necessary to destroy livestock in order to destroy Amalek. End quote. Impossible to think that any bloodline currently remaining on Earth is untainted by any sort of alternative DNA. Most nations have been intermingling together since time immemorial, and as stated before, sexual selection and geographic proximity are two of the most significant factors in determining the characteristics of every race on Earth. Over the last millennia, the average person has over a million grandparents, undoubtedly from a variation of bloodlines. The oldest remaining bloodlines of original man were and are in America and not Africa. The Y-DNA atom chromosome of the oldest bloodline found to date comes from Albert Perry, an indigenous American. A South Carolina man mislabeled as African-American, but is in actuality an indigenous American, has the oldest genetics in the world, older than the oldest tribes in Africa who are in reality Americans who had been deported to Africa many generations ago. And from that point, they intermixed with nations of non-humans, to create the spectrum of races inhabiting the Isles of the Gentiles as we see them today. 